Hello. Good morning. Nice to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm just absolutely great. I hope you are, are too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sparing your time. Right. So I just want to briefly introduce you to our viewers. You are an international authority on near-death experiences. In fact, you're one of the early pioneers in the field. Right. Since 1978. Since 1978. Yes. And, and this is the year where you had three near-death experiences yourself, which then... Well, 1977, the year before. Okay, yes. That's, and, and that's profoundly changed your life and started you on your journey. Well, that's why I became a researcher. I mean, nobody in their right mind would ever choose to be a re researcher in this kind of field. No way, no how. Um, in my third near-death experience, I was told by what I call the voice like none other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so big and so loud. It's just, woo! -hoo. And that voice told me to be a researcher. And you just sort of salute and say, okay. <laughs> and I was a cop's kid raised in a police station. So I used police investigative techniques as my protocol. Mm -hmm. then next year, um, after I was reasonably human again, I began my work. Yeah. Can you just tell us um, what happened to you during that NDE? I was raped. That re resulted in a miscarriage. Uh -huh. And all of the different problems came from difficulties of, with the miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I died twice in January, once in uh, March, well, three times back to back. I call it the heavenly sledgehammer effect. <laughs> I mean, that's how it hit me. <laughs> And then later that fall, I had three major relapses. So I had to relearn how to crawl, how to stand, how to walk, how to tell the difference between left and right, see properly, hear properly, and rebuild all my belief systems. Um, was this because the, the nervous system suffered from all the after effects? The body, the body trauma and, yeah, um, and inability to walk, just a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. And, then, and then on top of that, dealing with the experience itself, where I went, what happened, um, suddenly I'm in a whole new world. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm not in, this happened in, in, uh, in, in Boise, Idaho. And, you know, I'm not in Boise anymore. <laughs> I am elsewhere. And, um, you know, if you, if you can't speak to begin with, how do you voice where you are? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, um, so I really had, like I said, the heavenly sledgehammer effect <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and always that voice in, 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 uh, in my ears, always that voice, that mm -hmm. voice, that test revelation, mm -hmm. you have to do the research. Uh, I, I just started. I yeah. Took yeah. I did what I was told to do. Literally. Forget science, forget all of the, 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 the isms and schisms that everybody has, forget religion, forget everything. I did what that voice told me to do. And my sense is that voice was of God. So you have since then interviewed almost 5,000 or more than 5,000 people, adults yeah, and 5, children. 5,000 adults and children, yes, yes, yes. Produced 18 books. Yes. Uh, um, not all of them are about near death, but certainly allude to that. Mm -hmm. But most of them are, my research. Um, and I'm now working on my 19th book. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like near death experiences. Have you, have, you, have you never heard of them before? My life, my death, and my research. So I'm being personal for the first time in you know all these decades i'm really just coming out and saying you know here it is folks here i am i'm sure people like to read that uh well i hope so <laughs> yeah i wanted to talk to you about your previous book the forever angels oh yes that is near so death important. experiences in childhood and their lifelong impact before yes. we get into that can you explain to us a, a little bit the process of your work, of the research? Where did you find people? I think there's nearly 400 cases which went into this latest book of the young children. 
Yeah, that's 397. Mm -hmm. That's a major study. Um, Where did the cases come from? Oh, well over 60%. In fact, I think about 65% just came. And, and let, let me give you an example of how weird that was. Um, at the time, I was working for an internet c um, connect company, that is to say telephone, that is to say uh, after Ma Bell. And I was working jobs wherever my company sent me. My company sent me to Macon, jo Macon Georgia. And so, so it's, it's coffee break time. So I walked over to a truck stop. I'm in the middle of the truck stop, the, the, the dining area. Um, it, it's completely open. I'm in a little table. I'm, I'm reading a paperback. That's it. I mean, that's it. And this man comes up to me. I swear, almost as wide as he was tall. And he says to me, lady, anybody sitting in that chair next to you? I, <laughs> and I thought to myself, hmm, no. <laughs> Can I sit there? Thought for a minute and thought, well, okay. <laughs> so he sat down, puts his arms on the table, looks at, gets close to me, looks at me eyeball to eyeball. And he says, I want you to know I still chase women and I still drink. But I want you to know all about the time I died. So he tells me all about his, his experience, his near-death experience. That kind of thing happened to me constantly. Mm -hmm. I'd be walking down a street in Washington, D.C., uh, and a woman comes up, taps me on the shoulder. She says, you look like someone I could talk to. I need to tell somebody about when I died. You know, I, 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 I get in a, in a cab. I, I mean, I'm, I'm working a job in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So, so I, I'm getting, you know, I get in a cab. And I'm a very, very curious person. So whenever I'm in a cab, I'm always asking the cabbie, you, you know, uh, what is the tax base here? Have you got any colleges or universities? What, what are you known for in this area? And the guy got so frustrated. And he finally said to me, look, he says, I come from Egypt. <laughs> I'm here on a, on, a, on a, you know, a school study. And, and he said, I can't tell you anything about the area, but I can tell you all about the time I died. <laughs> and it was just like that for year after year after year. And I suppose later you were uh, well known, better known to the books, and then people would write to you or let you know. Well, no, anyway. I, I, I literally uh, later on bought ads and put them in magazines and newspapers. Um, I also uh, d did uh, email searches. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where the people come from. Okay. I think you've already written a book about children. Yeah. And this one, but this one is different because it's about the really, really young children. Well, that and also it's the first book ever written that, that, that gives you the complete round. That is to say, the first group I went after was in the 90s. And that's in the book, The, the New Children and Near-Death Experiences. So I went after, you know, um, anyone who had had a near-death experience, and most of them were the younger people, or I think the youngest I ever worked with was four years old. And mm -hmm. then, uh, uh, you know, into the adult years, but had that experience as a child. And then the second group I went after about maybe about three, four years ago now, I went after the older crowd. I wanted mature adults. Uh, those maybe in their 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And, and they had to verify having had a near-death experience this time specifically between the ages of five and birth. 
mm -hmm. or she was birth in five. Uh, so I was, I, I was going after the babies and the toddlers and, you know, the newly born. And they had to verify that. And this woman who was 82, she had a, a younger sister who remembered everything. So uh, she validated <laughs> what, her, what her older sister said. I mean, I really went after validations. And believe it or not, people do not forget. They don't forget a near-death experience. So I was able to then say to this older crowd, did having a near-death experience at such a young age make any difference in your life? If it did, what? So in essence, I was asking for essays. And boy, did I get them back. I even one of them was 50 pages. I mean, it could have been a book. Uh, many of them were so tear-stained, I couldn't hardly read them. People who had never been able to tell anybody nothing, and, and they finally could unload. Um, and people in poverty. Yeah. I, I had one person, uh, very specific, said researchers never go after people in poverty. Well, I did. Um, I went after all different types of sex all different types of, of race and, you know, all, all over the world. And uh, so I've, I've got a real good spread of different types of people. And I, 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 I ran into, I, I'm going to say, um, a large group of people, of course, scattered all over, whose near-death experience came from child abuse. And some of them were horrific. I had a three who were only conceived and born because their parents wanted sacrifices on Satan's altar. They were Satanists. And, and one of them, uh, see, how many did she have? Was it 10 or 14? I forget. A whole lot of them before the age of nine. And they started at um, six weeks of age. This mm -hmm. child was tortured again and again and again. This is the only reason her parents ever had her. She went through such abuse. You know, it just blows your mind. Of course, she's now in her 60s, and she was able to uh, look back and forgive her parents. Yeah. And, I, re I, remember, I remember reading about that case. Oh, jeez. And this lady, she, she did very well, considering. Yeah. I mean, just a remarkable recovery. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do these early childhood cases, and I think their experiences almost at birth, during birth, up to five years old, how do these cases of these small children, babies, differ from adult near-death experiences? Totally, totally, totally. Um, when you're talking about child near-death experiencers, age matters. So if you're going, uh, as I did, from uh, birth to the age of five, that literally is a cutoff. And mm -hmm. those born after that, not all of them, but most of them, um, the older kids, the tweens, the teens, and young adults, um, that's an entirely different venue. That's the venue we're used to. We know about those kinds of people because they had, they, they have a past, but, but, but your little ones, they don't have it before. So they can't compare. Your older child and teens and adults can compare. So we're familiar with that. I mean, we've got thousands of books about that. Raymond Moody talks about that. You know, all your major researchers are in that um, age, age group. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a few child experience uh, researchers, yes, who've written books, yes, but no one has uh, centered entirely on this youngest age group only one that did and uh it, it blew me it blew me away because their memory is of a 
and it's sort of like a well we could almost call it like a river i mean some of them um you know and even in the book some of them, some of them talk about past lives yes the majority do not the majority instead talk about the other side mm-hmm. their 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 home their homey mm-hmm. home it is like this this river of consciousness it's, mm-hmm. it's like a river and every once in a while there'll be a dip in the flow mm-hmm. and that's a life they'll come down and have a life and then go back up to the stream back up to the river mm-hmm. and what they what they mem- remember specifics they don't remember specifics like we do they remember specifics in 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 that sense of tone in that sense of memory in that sense of knowing in that sense of belonging in that sense of their home and describing their home but it isn't done in words you and i recognize yeah. it's like a different language mm-hmm. um and it fascinated me to listen to them talk about that that um true home that 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 river of consciousness um I mean it really blows your mind. <laughs> It's like yes, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So being that early, I assume they they wouldn't have a life review either, like many adults have when they have a near death experience. No life review. No such thing as a life review. What they do, and this fascinates me. I I didn't talk about it in the book, but uh, except one particular case. But what you find very often with 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 the babes is uh, out of body experiences are common. They're like breathing for a little one, and so these little babes they're keeping track of mom. They're keeping track of dad. They want to know where their mama is. And they want to know what their mama is doing. They want to know where their daddy is, and they want to know what their daddy is doing. So, if mom and dad are doing strange things, when they're older, they talk about it. So this is during the near death experience when they when there's a crisis, when they're unwell, when when something happens, they not during their experience is after their experience. Um, this is part of the after effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, the after effects include. Um, the ability to uh, roam the world and look around, especially in their family, and 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 they want to know what's going on, mm-hmm. and many times brother and sister too. Um, they'll be peeking over your shoulder. <laughs> This little baby over here is going to be peeking over your shoulder over there and seeing. What you're doing, and, and would they be it. would they be asleep at the time or? They're just roaming. It's a roaming mind. That's amazing. What was really amazing for me is is I had two of them, who were there when their parents conceived them. Mm-hmm. So at the very beginning. And one of them drew a picture, <laughs> and uh, and later on showed mom and dad. Here's the picture. Yeah, and and of of you know, um, the sexual part, and mom and dad were so embarrassed <laughs> because it was accurate. Mm-hmm. The child saw it all. Well, it wasn't a child yet. It is still like you know, figment in the imagination, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So um, how how do you explain but, that? I, I'm really convinced that our soul. And we are a soul. We're not just personalities. We're, mm-hmm. you know, we're not just bodies. We are filled with that spirit, that soul. And our soul um, is unlimited. It can go in anywhere. It can do anything it wants to. And our soul, when it is now inhabiting a body on Earth wants to know what's going around that body. And many of them know they're here on assignment. Some of them don't. Some of them feel like they were kicked in. 
Um, but they still want to know the terrain. What's going on here? And they'll, they'll hang around and look around. Um, and there's lots of stories in that in the book. So tell me about the one in the womb, because that's fascinating. Oh, uh, th this, this one gal, her name is Penny. Uh, and <laughs> she was so upset whenever her mother smoked. For heaven's sake, women out there, don't smoke. Don't drink your baby. We'll pick it up right away, right away. Mm -hmm. And 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 Penny was was really upset whenever her mother would light up a cigarette, because that nicotine would go directly into the womb, mm -hmm. and uh, the child would get a high. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. So careful, moms. <laughs> Your kids know what, what's going on. From the near-death experience in adults, the experiences, they take quite some time to integrate the experience, sometimes years. How do the, the little children, the, the babies, cope with their experience in, in later life, in their development? It's, it's, a, it's a whole different pattern. Okay, the average adult takes seven to ten years to integrate their experience. The average child takes 20 to 40. A child does not integrate. A child compensates. The child wants to be what their parents want them to be. Uh, they want to, you know, survive in school, do well in school. They, they want to meet all these benchmarks. And, and even into adulthood, they're still um, trying to match themselves up with the community, what's expected of them, what they see around them, that this is what they ought to be. They go to college, they get married, all these things. And they, and they never, ever look back or seldom look back uh, and take a look at you know, how that experience affected them. And when they do, it's, um, it's, it can be very upsetting. Are you uh, saying they're almost blanking it out or just well, not thinking about it? it? They don't know what to do with it because they don't have words. Mm -hmm. I mean, what family, normal family, regular family, is going to be talking about out-of-body out of trips? What normal, regular family is going to, uh, is going to talk about the, um, the aunt that just died that the child's seen? Um, so, so, the, so the child, as they grew up, they learned to, to shut down. They learned to shut up. Uh, they learned to match um, society, the, the people in society. Uh, they do not go back and bring that forward. And, and what they're bringing forward, I, I want your people to realize here that the average near-death experiencer, not all of them certainly, but the average, in fact, better than average, come back smarter than they were before or could have been before or the average child is before. They come back smarter. Many of them geniuses. Um, it's just an incredible, um, their mind, um, I, I would say easily, um, certainly 75%, 70 to 75%, maybe higher, uh, of, of the, of, of the people in my, in my research base were abstracting before first grade. Now, let, let's stop for a minute and take a look at that. Let me give you an example. This is this boy in the state of Georgia. He made it to the first grade. He drowns halfway through school year. Um, had a near-death experience. Comes back. Still in the school year. What do most kids read in the first grade? I don't know what they're reading in England, but in the United States, they're reading C Spot Run, Dick and Jane, you know, simple <laughs> words. This little boy comes back and he's reading Greek mythology 
and understands it and goes up to his teacher and says, why was the book Robinson Crusoe ever written? This kid is abstracting. Mm-hmm. And um, and e- equally, nearly that number, perhaps again more, are born or, or, or come back from that experience of synesthesia. They get synesthesia from the experience. Um, that's an elaboration of the limbic system in the brain, your, your, your sensory uh, abilities. A synesthesia is those normal abilities get sort of crossed up or switched or changed. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Um, this is from, from myself. No, I was not born a near-deather, um, but I was born with synesthesia. So in the first grade, I was the only kid in school that could smell color, see music, and hear numbers. I was punished constantly for being a liar. And all I did was tell the truth. Um, so synesthesia can be a real marker. And invariably, parents will turn against the child or, you know, brush it off. I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to hear about that. That is a major, major blow to the child. Believe me, I know from the first grade how difficult that is when you're you're constantly being called a liar when you are telling the truth. Mm-hmm. So and these these children develop this after the experience. They have it afterward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I again. And they didn't have it before. No. So we we we've had. We have major things happening in the brain and the nervous system. I'm looking at, at, at the near-death experience in, in those little ones. And I'm seeing these kinds of major neurological changes that are occurring. At, at the very time when uh, the patterns in the brain and nervous system are, are just being laid. So that's flipping these kids to a different avenue or a different growth pattern. And I really, 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 really want to get that day to come when we have the kind of scientists that would, be, would tackle this and take a good look at little ones, babies, toddlers, young children, having the power punch, and I think that's what it is, mm-hmm. a near-death experience is a power punch, having that power punch hit when, they're, when their brain and nervous system, the, the patterning is being li- laid out. Um, because we have all kinds of things happen to these kids. Uh, l- let me just give you some typicals here. Um, the problem sleeping, 67%. Yeah, Insomnia. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Out of body experience is 62%, aware of the future, 61%. Uh, turn to drug use, 46%. Turn to alcohol, 45%. Mm-hmm. Those are large figures. Mm-hmm. And they do, and they, and they do, uh, do it um, uh, because they feel like, you know, it, not necessarily that they're insane, but there's something wrong with them and they can't. Uh, they, they can't handle it. Nobody um, will, will, will address it satisfactor- satisfactorily. So they turn to drugs and alcohol. Um, lose their bonding with parents, 90%. 90%. 90%. Most of them lose their bonding with parents. That doesn't mean they don't love their parents. Mm-hmm. It does mean they're not bonded to them. Why is that? They look at parents very, very differently. Well, what's a parent? Well, you know, to a little one who, who's just coming in. I mean, what's a parent? <laughs> they really don't know. Uh, and so it's, it's a sense of finding out. And, and many of them do know where they're coming into that particular parent uh, and why. 
Um, you know, they may not like it, but there it is. Um, empathic, 84%. 84% of these kids come back at empathic. Highly intelligent, 75%. Mm-hmm. Under the age of six. Well, right around the age of six. That, that, are, that are tested for intelligence. 48% test 150 to 160 on standard IQ tests. Now stop for a minute. That's high. Uh, And the younger, the higher that score. So let's say from birth to the age of 15 months who have a near-death experience, they'll test out with that score, 81% of them. If they had a dark light experience instead of a white light experience or a bright light experience from birth to 15 months, they'll test out 180 and above. So there's something significant happening to the brain. 74% of them do very, very well in life. They become rich. Many of them become rich. Some of them became millionaires do very, very well in life. That same number, 74%, have suicide ideation throughout their life. But they're uh, not necessarily the same people. Not necessarily, but the same number. One of the things that I'm noticing here in this suicide ideation, it's not necessarily that they want to kill themselves, um, some maybe fantasize on that, but, but rather this longing, this desire to go back. They want to go back. They don't want to be here. They want to go back. They want to go back. Well, it, it, it's, it's this sense of they want to go back home. It, it's not really suicide ideation, although it, 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 it sort of tracks that way and we recognize it that way. What it really is, is homesickness. And, and that woman who was 82, still her entire life was homesick for home. Mm. Never got over it. So it's not just when they're young or during childhood or adolescence. Throughout their life. Throughout mm. their life. Homesick for heaven. Yeah. So when you're looking at kids, you're looking at a very, very different... Um, if you're looking at young kids, little kids, you're... you're You really need to look at the near-death experience in a different way. Uh, When you're looking at these kids overall, they're really not like adults coming back and saying, well, I'd like to be a healer or I want to be a preacher or I want to, you know, I I want somehow to be in the healing or, or therapeutic or counseling area. Not these kids. They want to grab into science and study and research to find out what makes the world tick. Mm -hmm. They really want to examine this world. That's present overall. Yes, some of them become psychic, some of them become mediums, some of them become healers, and, and, you know, some of them go that route, but not the majority. And And I truly feel we have to look at that. Mm-hmm. But somehow the brain is, is, is altered in such a way that their curiosity is defining the world. What, what makes this world tick? How is it formed? What can we do in the way of altering things? Mm-hmm. You mentioned the, the black light and the bright light earlier. Well, there's really three lights. And the kids talk a lot about them. uh Adults don't that much, but kids do. Um, Even even the older kids do, but certainly the youngest kids talk about this a great deal. Uh, There's that really raw, powerful light uh, that really doesn't have much of a color. It's so radiant. It's, It's almost beyond color. And then there's the black or dark light. Many of them say it has purple tinges to it. And then there's this bright or white light. 
So they'll talk about this really powerful light. Ooh, how powerful it is. And then this black or dark light is very loving. It's very healing. Um, kids, the kids love to be in that light. It's just so wonderful. And then this bright or white light, some, some say, you know, it has maybe a little silver or gold in it, but mostly a, a bright or white light. That light um, knows you, knows all about you. You can talk to that light. Um, then there's just something very uh, powerful to you and your life about this light. Um, so, and, and again, the kids are very specific. You, know, you just love working with kids. They, they say, well, this really big, powerful light that um, it's so radiant. That's God's light. And that black or dark light, that's mother light. Mm -hmm. And this white or bright light, that's father light. Mm -hmm. And that father light and mother light come from God's light. <laughs> Kids are very specific about that. <laughs> Was this one child saying this or have you found that repeatedly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do they tend to have the same sequence as you often read about in the adults? They something happens, they come out of their body, and then travel travel towards a light. They don't travel to a light. Um, they travel to um, explore the world they're in, explore their family. Uh, they want to know where Mama is. They want to know where Daddy is. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll explore the terrain, you know, they, they do a lot of that. And in school, <laughs> school is so boring to these kids because, uh, because they, they know more than the teacher does. They know <laughs> more than their parent does. So school is boring. Yeah, so they spend the most of their time outside on a tree or something, you know, just trying to get out of that classroom. <laughs> a lot of the, these later adults when they had these experiences in in childhood had quite extraordinary abilities often psychic abilities or premonitions that's that's, that's not extraordinary or unusual with these children what what's extraordinary is how they're treated how they're punished sometimes beaten um many times made fun of Many times called liar, liar. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to handle, or they're, or they're shunned. Um, they, they, they get a lot of problems in school. You know, they, the kids will really ma make life miserable for them. So they learn to, to shut up. Uh, they learn not to share. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that you know, they're often aware of short term, um, futuristic kinds of things, sometimes long term, but mostly it's short term. And um, I was talking to this, this one gal, she was uh, maybe 12. And she says, why, why, why should I go out on dates? I, I mean, I know what's going to happen before it does. And I know what he's going to do. So I just turned him down. <laughs> they know what's going to happen uh, or you know why should I get in that car with all these other kids I know where they're going to go I know what they're going to do I don't want to do that so I turn them down I think I read that often the adults will say oh I've seen an angel you say that the, the small children will describe it differently no. no a little kid won't use won't use the term angel unless they've heard it on television or unless they've heard it in their family. They will never, never use the term angel. They will call it a bright one or the loving ones. I was called in um, by a reporter. And where was it in Missouri where they had this huge, huge um, tornado that struck and, and, and killed so many people. 
and and a lot of the children were, were saying to the reporters they were talking about the butterfly people and the butterfly people were everywhere so this reporter called me because he, he, he knew um my expertise and my background and he said they're not calling them angels these these people that save them and help them and are there to protect them they're not using the word angel they're calling them butterflies uh, and i said that's how you know that it's, it's genuine if they were using the term angel they were probably prompted to do that children don't use that term and these were several children yeah oh, during many, that time yeah many yeah yeah you know one of the things i i did because of uh, uh the extraordinary uh stories that children tell you uh, and little ones um one of the things i did was to design and write six six little um ebooks wonderful little books for kids it's called the animal light series and and i did that on purpose mainly for 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 parents uh because i mean what parent really knows how to open up that door to the child and uh, i yeah uh, you know about birth you know do you remember being born or this is this kind of thing um uh, you don't have to have a near death experience I, i mean normal kids regular kids i mean if you've got the majority of children near death experiencers who can remember their birth and clearly how many normal kids can do that I bet you a whole lot. So I wrote the Animal Light series mainly for parents so they could sit down with their child and they could go through these books and read aloud and then say to the little child, "Do you remember anything like Busy Betty Wiggles?" So it's designed for them to to trigger these memories to to get start talking about it and yeah. They're specially designed. All, mm-hmm. all, especially this business about miscarriage. That's a big one um, that we're talking about a lot now with the mothers. Why is that? Let's talk about miscarriage with the baby. One of the things that I learned in my research is that um, these, these little babies that come back and they, and, they, and they talk about their experience, they know if a previous being was in that womb before and they will talk about the previous child and when they're older maybe pick up a conversation with with mom and you know who was it that died before me i mean how's that kid going to know that and the mother isn't going around saying i miscarried mm-hmm. so especially if that child had a near death experience that child knows and will tell their mother about it so you know when we really dig deep in the what children are saying we are forced to think again about who we are as human beings what is it that uh, this thing we call the soul um what is it about death and life what is it about the life continuum or that river of consciousness what is it that we are it's like many times in, in, in well let me give you an example of of these out of body experiences you read my thoughts <laughs> <laughs> i love that uh, this one particular child let's see what was her name alma she was about 2 years old and she was being raped by a family friend the do- the door to her room was shut and man came in an older man and she's 2 years old he's on top of her of course his stomach he almost you know suffocates her um and he rapes her she automatically now is on the ceiling looking down and she sees 
that's how she saves herself. She's on the ceiling looking down. Please, 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 all of you, parents, counselors, therapists, all of you, realize this is a defense mechanism. It has little or nothing to do with out-of-body experiences, uh, except, you know, that's the standard that, of how it happens. It is a defense mechanism. Uh, doesn't matter the kid, whether they had a near-death experience or not, the average child, certainly more than average with near-death experiencers, but the average child, if they are in um, an extreme situa situation, they're being beaten, raped, or, or any of this kind of thing, they will leave their bodies and view their body from a point above. And very seldom will they talk about it because who's going to believe them? But they can see what's going on. That's how they save, save themselves. That's how they save their identity, their, their, their soul. That's how they save themselves is, is, is to leave the body. To not and experience. Come back and re-inhabit later. But, but the essence of them, their consciousness, their soul will leave. So mm -hmm. that's a defense mechanism. Um, we commonly say it's a psychic ability with kids and many times with adults with kids that's a defense mechanism it's how you save that precious identity that precious part of you quite a few of your cases describe other extraordinary things i remember one about a child seeing how prayer works itself out oh yeah prayer beams this one particular little boy just came right out and says oh those are prayer beams <laughs> And, and, and he described them. There, there's a light, a band of light that comes out of the person saying the prayer and goes over to the person who, who receives the prayer. So the prayer isn't just words you're saying. It isn't just feelings you get inside. It's a literal band of energy. Mm -hmm. and, and that energy takes, it's a beam. It's like a beam. What happens? when a prayer beam hits you you know what's it like for you hey, describe this for me he says oh it's just warm and cuddly all over i just feel warm and cuddly all over <laughs> so i thought that was just great but but kids see prayer they do yeah so to be clear they is this again a child during a near-death experience or is it that they are generally so open. They see invisible things. This invisible mystic world is open to them. It's just open to them. Even afterwards, and they keep describing well, yeah, these phenomena. Uh, the only time that shuts down is when they're old, older and they've been uh, made fun of enough times or see that other kids don't do this, and so they'll shut it up. But um, yeah, it'll, it'll go on as long as they live. What about Jesus and other deities that oh, you often, that you often find in adults? Uh, there were, there were um, three people in my, in my research base who were raised in voodoo, voodoo cultures. They had never heard of Jesus. They'd never heard of God. They never heard of the Bible. I mean... Never heard those terms. And they did not know each other, you know, not related or anything. These three, in their near-death experience, were visited by Jesus. Each one of the three knew Jesus' name and called him by name. Mm -hmm. so how, how do you explain that? That, that, that just, you know, it's, it's like twang. What do you do with that in your, in your brain? Well, where do you put that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can put that spiritually, but as a researcher, I don't know where to put it. Yeah, yeah. You know, except an anomaly. <laughs> that was an anomaly. <laughs> I remember one case, I think, where the child grew up in, in Asia, in Hong Kong. Well, yeah, there, there was a number of them. I, I, I had a number of Chinese people. 
who had no knowledge of God, Bible, but they talked about figures and happenings in the same way that someone in Utah would say, you know, uh, but of course their words were different. It was the same thing, same pattern. You know, I caught on to this when I was doing adults, you know, decades ago. Uh, this business of, about idols and images and word use and this kind of thing. And in some of those countries, they're talking about Yama Toots. Yama Toots are servants of the Lord Yama, who is uh, the, sort of like the king of the underworld. So a friend of mine had, had them draw a picture of their Yama Toots. And then I had uh, a cowboy in Wyoming and several other people that I had draw their angels. Now these are adults and, and, and draw their angels. You, you couldn't tell the difference at all. The only difference is, is the word use. The only difference is the culture. The mm -hmm. only difference is, what, is, is their exposure. But the thing itself is the same. Something I wanted to ask you, many experiences have the experience or perhaps the vision of the whole universe, creation, the creative process. Um, they all seem to differ, although they're talking about the same thing. How do you rate the, the value or the validity of, of these experiences? Are these just subjective experiences which are meant to tell the person something or would you say they they carry a, a greater truth you re you realize of course that i was able to find a pattern of four different types of experiences mm -hmm. and, and and the first type was very quick and did, uh, uh, didn't have that many aspects to it um, children have a lot of those. Uh, the second type was the unpleasant or hellish experience. Um, one out of seven in my research base had that. Then you have the pleasant or heavenly experience. I think it was uh, maybe 48% had that. And then you had what I call the transcendent, transcendent experience. Almost never do you have a past life review in that one. Um, the, uh, that one is more ge geared to the world as we know it, or the world as it really is, and what you can do uh, to, to be a part of, of uh, making the world a better place kind of thing. Um, the, the life review is found in, in, the, in the second and third one, you know, the unpleasant or the pleasant one. That's where you get the life reviews. You don't get it in the first one. You don't get it in the last one. Um, so when we're talking about what's it all about, Alfie, you really need to look at impact, about how long it was, the impact the, um, of the experience. A lot of your adult experiences focus more on the out of body. A lot of them focus on the life review um, not that many go into the other worlds, except briefly. Uh, your greeters, by the way, um, are, are um, you certainly a loved one who has died and got on before, might be an angelic kind of being, but often animals, animals, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe a pet that, that's got, you know, died and gone on before will come back or, uh, other kinds of animals, but especially birds. A lot of adults and children have birds in their experience. I don't know why birds, but there's a lot of birds. Um, but, uh, and, and the out of body experience, that is just so, so, that's number one. That's the number one item or element that, that, that these people go through. And, and, the, and this, this one particular fellow, uh, he, he's riding along a heart attack or something and, he, you know, the rescue squad and, and, and the rescue um, 
uh, car or, or a bus is just right. In. He's on top of it. He's not in, inside in his body being cared for by the rescue crew, crew. He's on top of it. And he's enjoying the trip and the, you know, and what he's seeing. And, and he's laughing and he's just having a gay old time. And he describes all that, you know, it's like, oh, that was so cute. Um, so that you, you get a lot of that. Uh, so those people who go deeper, um, I'm one of those. There are many others that went d deeper into what's it all about Alfie and the different worlds and different dimensions and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, in, invariably, remember always that a person can only describe what they went through according to their language and what they've been exposed to in their culture. So they're going to struggle to expand that. And you do, you do go through a lot of struggles because, uh, I mean, what's the words? How do you describe this? You really can't verbalize it. Um, and so those that went further and deeper are really challenged by insanity. Are they sane? How do I describe this? Some of them come back with, with, you know, there's a first heaven, a second heaven, a third heaven, a fourth heaven. Uh, some come back with those kind of descriptions of uh, different dimensions, different speeds, different things that you see. They'll come back with that. Some come back so changed that they really cannot verbalize in any way that makes sense where they were or, or what they encountered. So in the near 5,000 adults and children that I've worked with, easily 98 to 99% come back totally uh, accepting and knowing God. And they don't come back believing in God. They come back knowing God. There's a big difference there. Huge difference. Um, many of those who were non-believers before, atheists before, come back totally, whoa, yes, there's a God. Is, is, is that God? Does that God match the descriptions the various religions paint, like Muslim or Christian or, you know? Um, not necessarily. Some do paint those kind of pictures. But most of them come back unable to really describe God because God is so big, so powerful, so massively huge. How can you use any word to describe that? Uh, we don't have words in our dictionary that really can encapsulate or describe in any manner God. So that's the big one. Mm -hmm. um, they come back absolutely convinced there's life after death. Do we come back after death? Uh, is there life after death? Yes. Flat out, yes. You know, forget this stuff. Yes. Um, are we always met by someone when we die? No, not always. Uh, I know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, my mentor, said, yes, 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 guaranteed, yes, there's always someone to meet you. No, there isn't. There wasn't in my experience, for instance. Never had one. Uh, met the beings later. Um, and that often happens, by the way. 
um, and, and, and you come back absolutely convinced that everyone has a soul, yes, yes, it's, yes. there is a soul, we are a soul, we're not just a body with all this fluffy hair, <laughs> you know, I'm almost 84, woohoo, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? I'm a soul. I'm this huge, massive vehicle of energy and fire and, and curiosity and knowing and joy. You can't possibly stick all that into the, the identity of human being body. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't fit. <laughs> into our dictionary of what a body is we are a soul i think you answered my last question because i was going to ask you if you were to describe in let's say five minutes what are the most important conclusions you draw number one there's a god number mm -hmm. two we are a soul that we are part of a massive collection of other beings and we're here to learn or experience according to our need or according to our curiosity or according to what seems right for us to do at that time. But for me, what absolutely thrills me every day is this, I am so full of God. How could there ever be any other reality? And the way I express that is through joy. Even when I'm miserable, I'm joyful. <laughs> <Really>. <laughs> I mean, I can be hurting and I'm still joyful. I mean, how do you describe that? I think you said it all. You might be kind of interested in how I got my name. Yeah. Um. Everything I do is based on prayer. Literally. That's how I live my life. Uh, so the, the way I got my name, I, I, had, I had a vision. It, it, was this, it was this most unusual, dramatic, powerful vision I think I've ever had. And in that vision, there's this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful black screen. A beautiful black warm, beautiful black. And, and across that, that screen was these massive white block letters, P period, M period, H period, at water. And <laughs> I was so shocked. I jumped out of bed, fortunately landed on my feet. Now I'm looking at a, at a light colored wall. And so the colors reversed and the block letters are now that beautiful black. So I go, and one of them almost hit my nose. I mean, they were that real. So I go screaming out of my, my bedroom because I was renting a room from a retired couple at the time. And, you know, we sat down in the breakfast nook and I'm, and you know, I'm talking about, you know, PMH. That's the dumbest, stupidest egotistical, ridiculous name I've ever heard. So I, I heard myself, you know, I'm almost cussing at the name. And I caught myself and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I, <laughs> I, asked, I asked God to give me a name. So maybe I need to go back into prayer and say, did I interpret you right? <laughs> is this really the name you want me to wear for the rest of my life? This is crazy. So I went back into prayer and um, I don't know, it's like, it's, it's like, how long did it take? Three or four weeks later, I, uh, I really felt like I'd been born with that name. It felt so right. I was born with that name. So I legally changed my name. Um, it's not, I mean, just get rid of the periods. It's just PMH. And PMH is a name. It's not initials. It's my name. And I didn't discover why I was given that name until about maybe 20 years later. 
And then it was so plain, me and everybody else looking at it, it was so plain and so clear. Had I had a female name, my work would never have been accepted in the field of near-death studies. We're talking the 80s here. My, my, my work would never have been accepted. I either had to have a masculine name or a neutral name. So all of my work comes out as PMH Atwater, a neutral name. You know, it's, it's like God knew exactly what God was doing. <laughs> it was me that was confused. <laughs> so I wear that name with pride and joy and thankfulness. That again, God knew what God was doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good note to finish on. Well, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. And I'll be looking forward for the next three books then. Yes, but certainly the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.